Hi everyone, it's Olivia and welcome to this channel where we talk about Rizzo Zine's art and all sorts of good stuff. Now, this video is a continuation of my DIY booklets for zines part 1 video, so that would make this DIY booklets for zines part 2. Now in this video, I'm going to show you ways of making stapled booklets using different tools. So some of these tools are cheaper and easier to obtain than others, but I'm just going to show you what I have to give you options. Another thing I'm going to show you is that in running my small press, I've actually had to buy a few more expensive pieces of equipment because I've had to make hundreds or even thousands of booklets more efficiently and so I'm gonna show you the equipment that I have in the small studio just for interest. As a disclaimer, the equipment that I have in the small studio is nowhere near the scale of the equipment that you will find in one of those larger and more professional printing houses. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that and that is not the purpose of this DIY video anyway. So yeah, without further ado, let's get started. With regards to paper and making booklets, the main thing I want to note is that it's generally good practice to fold your booklet parallel to the grain direction. I don't think it's super important if you're just making zines at home on your own and actually some specialty papers might not even have a clear grain direction. But because I make zines for customers, I have to conform to this convention and that's why I mention it. And also, it's generally good to make sure all your paper has the same grain direction. For example, if you're using different types of paper for different pages of your zine, it's advisable that you keep the paper grain facing the same direction throughout. If you google up paper grain direction and bookbinding, you will find more in-depth articles about it. And there are already a bunch of YouTube videos that talk about how to figure out what the grain is of your paper. So if you aren't sure, please check out those videos. But since I already have you here, I can show you a bit of a test. So I made two stacks of the same kind of paper. For this stack, the paper grain is short, meaning the grain is parallel to the shorter side. So when you fold it in half, the grain is parallel to the spine, which is correct. For this other stack, the paper is grain long. When you fold it in half, the grain is not parallel to the spine. It is going across the spine. So this is wrong. So I turn these two different grain stacks into booklets using my booklet maker. And as you can see, they sit differently. The grain short stack, where you have the fold of the spine going parallel to the paper grain, is sitting nicely. Whereas the grain long stack, where you have the grain going across the fold of the spine, is a bit odd. The paper I'm using is a bit of a heavier stock too, so it's not super obvious. But in some cases, doing it the wrong way actually causes the paper to buckle and the edges even curl a little bit and it might get worse over time too. So yeah, if you can, and if something like this seems important to you, then it's good practice to make the folds of your booklets parallel to the grain direction. If you plan to use a cardstock or stiff board type paper for your cover, and you find that as you're folding it, the crease is going all over the place, you might want to score your cardstock. For covers and other thicker papers, I really think it's easiest and looks best when you score prior to folding. In fact, I've made zines that are completely made of cardstock for both the covers and the inside pages, and I had to score everything. Here are some tools for scoring covers. The first one is actually a bone folder tool. Unfortunately, I don't have that tool, but I'll just put up a picture on the screen of what it looks like. An alternative, and honestly what I used for thousands of covers and zines, is an embossing ball stylus tool. 
The little nibs come in different sizes, but I just grabbed this one, which is not the smallest, but not the biggest, so like medium. And the first thing you can do is just use a ruler and run the tool down your cover. And when you fold it, it's way neater than without the score mark. The other tool I use is this manual paper cutter. It originally comes with two attachments, a blade for cutting and a dull one for scoring. But I tried the scoring attachment and it didn't work. So I ended up taking off both attachments and just leaving the ruler by itself. What I do is use the groove as a guide for scoring. And then over on the other side, if I'm scoring a lot of the same covers over and over, I would just make a little stopper using masking tape. So this is actually what I used for quite a while, this combination of the ruler with the groove thing and the embossing ball stylus. And then I started getting really large greeting card orders. So the greeting cards, they all have to be scored and it was just too much work and took up too much time to do it this way. So I ended up buying a scoring machine from a local print and graphics supplier. So this scoring machine is what I use now for if I have to do a bunch of scoring. So I just place these magnetic guides where I need and push the handle down to make a score mark. And it has really helped with my efficiency. And the last thing I want to mention is from which direction to fold after you score. So I typically score from the outside of the fold. So when I score, the score mark will be indented where I have placed my stylus, whereas on the other side, it will have a bump. And I fold the paper where it's bumpy. So I fold it so that the bumpy side is on the inside and the indented side is outside. Okay, moving on. So you scored your cardstock. Now it's time to staple your booklet. Unless you're making a tiny zine, you can't use a regular stapler to staple the booklet. The space inside the stapler simply won't fit your paper and the stapling part won't reach the spine. The first tool you can use is a long arm stapler. It's a stapler that has an extra long inside space so your paper will fit and the stapling part will reach the spine. There's also a cool little rubber stopper that will help you space out your staples and keep them even. The second tool is a swivel or swing arm booklet stapler. This type of stapler is really cool because you can swivel the stapling mechanism by 90 degrees and approach the spine from the side of the paper. I have two sizes here with me, a standard size and a number 10 size. The standard size, from what I've observed, is the most common size in North America. This is the staple size that you will see in most stores like Staples, Walmart, etc. The number 10 size stapler is smaller than the standard stapler and 
It's more commonly found in Asia and countries like the Philippines, Japan, Taiwan. You can find both number size 10 staplers and standard staplers in Asia, but in North America, the number 10 sized staplers are less common. You can still find them, but they're not standard issue. I like these swivel or swing arm booklet staplers because they're smaller and therefore more portable than the long arm stapler, which can be large and a bit cumbersome. Like if you're going to a zine fair and you need to finish booklets in a jiffy, it's just a lot easier and convenient to bring a swivel booklet stapler with you than a long arm stapler. The last tool is something I want to show you just because I happen to have it and it's what I've used for making many many booklets and that's a booklet maker machine. There are a lot of models and they all have their capacities and limitations. I got the cheapest one I could afford which is this booklet maker. As I later discovered, it's not really the best for Rezo because it uses friction to fold the booklets and the friction causes the ink to rub off and sometimes it makes the covers very dirty, so I have to do extra work to keep the booklet covers clean. I also had to remove the safety cover to make it easier and faster for me to get to the rollers and clean and wipe them down. The rollers get dirty with ink really fast and then that ink rubs off on the cover. Anyway, the point is this machine is really messy to work with. Plus, it's limited in the sizes of booklets that it can make because these staple guides are on designated spots. It was primarily made for offices, so you can make standard booklets like 8.5 by 11 and 5.5 by 8.5. But if you're a small press making booklets for artists, you realize that artists want to make booklets that are all different sizes. So I had to make some jigs to try to make those other sizes work. And also this one has a 10 sheet limit and even fewer sheets if you're using thicker papers or card stocks. So I can't make really thick booklets with this machine. All right, so you've stapled your booklets. Let's now talk a bit about trimming. If you're DIYing, you might just elect to not trim your booklets and leave the sides uneven. But if you have bleed, or if you want to have even sides, you can use a metal ruler and an X-Acto knife or a paper cutter to just slowly trim the edge. Please use a metal ruler with a cork on the back to prevent the knife from slipping. And if you can, also use a paper cutting board. Also, I prefer my blade to be sharp for cleaner cuts. When you are cutting, I like to go medium light pressure and just make the same cuts over and over until you cut all the way down. I find that this is neater and results in a more successful trim job than trying to go really heavy with fewer cuts. So I would just take your time with it. Alright, so while we're watching me trim the booklet, I'd like to provide you with a few bonus tips. These tips can be found in my booklet basics tutorial and I'm going to link that video in the description section below. So please refer to that tutorial if you're ever confused. So my first tip is that if you need your art to go to the edge, please provide your art with some bleed. And also give your content a bit of extra space due to booklet creep, especially if you're going to be trimming the sides. Next, you want to plan in multiples of four pages when you are planning out your booklet. And lastly, for a special looking booklet, you can also add special foldouts and inserts. For the press, I use a paper stack cutter. It lets me set a stopper and cut a stack of papers at once. I have a small manual one right here. Large print jobs have massive machines that can do huge stacks at once, but for me, I like to just do one zine at a time to be honest, 
because it results in fewer mistakes and I'm definitely not making booklets at the quantity of a large print shop. Yeah, so after you trim everything up, you're basically done with your booklet. Yay! So that's it for this DIY booklets for zine part 2 video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you found this tutorial helpful. If you'd like to support this channel, please visit the Olivia and Pin Dot store. I'm going to put a link to it in the description section below. And I'm actually going to put up my remaining stock of these swivel swing arm booklet staplers in the number 10 size. So this is smaller than the standard sized stapler and this takes the number 10 staples. So when you buy the stapler, I'm going to include a couple boxes of the staples to go with it. So yeah, purchasing these staplers is a way to directly support this channel as I do pack and ship everything myself. In my next video, we're going to make some Rizo Memo Pads. It's a project I've wanted to do for a while, so I'm really excited to make the memo pads and film it and share the process with you. So yeah, thank you so much once again, and if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please give it a like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section below, and I will see you in the next one.